Hello friends, welcome to the Pathology Insights and uh, today in this video we will be discussing about the morphology and the consequences of the cirrhosis. In my previous video I have already discussed about the uh, etiopathogenesis and today we will be discussing only about the changes morphology and its uh, and the consequences of the cirrhosis. Now this cirrhotic change in the liver this was first described by Morgagini. Now uh, this Morgagini was an uh, Italian, he was an anatomic pathologist. He conducted some hundreds of autopsies and when he was doing the autopsies, he observed these erotic changes in the liver. When the liver is fibrotic, it is smaller in the size and it has a nodular surface. So such changes he has seen in uh, the many uh, autopsies. So he described these changes but he did not give the name or the term as a cirrhosis. Later on, René Lennick was the person who used the term cirrhosis. So in the Greek, cirrhosis means orange color. So he has given this term because might be he is seeing uh, the cirrhotic changes in the fatty liver where we have an yellowish tinge. So when he observed the cirrhotic change, it was yellowish tan in color. So he used the term cirrhosis. Later on, the patho pathogenesis part like we have a degeneration, regeneration and the fibrosis. This process was described by the Rosselli in 1930. Now coming to the morphology of the cirrhosis, grossly when we see liver appears nodular, uh, it has a nodular surface and they also call it as a hobnailed appearance. Hobnail means actually these are the nails which are used at the bottom of the uh, shoes to have a firm grip. Now these nails will have a large heads. So the appearance if you see the knobbed appearance is present. So similarly uh, in the liver also we have a knobbed appearance on the surface. So they use the term as a hobnail the surface and the size of the liver is reduced because uh, in the cirrhosis we have a loss of hepatic parenchyma because of the necrosis of the hepatocytes and at the same time we have increased deposition of the collagen and the fibrosis so there will be contraction uh, after the fibrosis so because of the loss of the parenchyma and because of the increased fibrosis there will be decrease in the size of the liver so we have a nodular surface and then we have a decrease in the size of the liver. Now in some conditions by seeing the color uh, of the liver we can tell what can be the cause. If it has a more uh, yellowish tinge then, you then it might be on the background of the alcoholic fatty liver and if it is a rusty brown might be there is a hemochromatosis and if it is a cirrhotic liver has a greenish tinge then it is because of the biliary obstruction. So in some conditions by seeing the color of the liver we can guess what can be the etiology of it. Now uh, as I told you in the cirrhotic liver we have a nodules. So depending upon the size of the nodule again cirrhotic liver cirrhosis is again classified as micronodular cirrhosis or macronodular cirrhosis. Now the cutoff point for this is 3 mm. If the nodule size is less than 3 mm we call it as a micronodular cirrhosis. Similarly, if we have larger than 3 mm, we call it as a macronodular cirrhosis. We have a condition in between that is a mixed type where we have both micronodular and the macronodule, macronodules. So uh, in the initial, like in alcoholic fatty liver also, initially we will have the micronodular cirrhosis and slowly at the end stages it becomes macronodular. So in the transition phase we have both micro and macronodules. So in that conditions we call it as a mixed type of the cirrhosis. Now the conditions which are responsible for the micronodular cirrhosis is alcohol, hemochromatosis, chronic biliary obstruction and the Indian childhood cirrhosis. Indian childhood cirrhosis is uh, because of more intake of the copper because of the toxicity in the water or the food when the child takes more of the copper he'll have the toxicity due to the copper so that causes damage to the hepatocytes and the conditions where we have macronodular cirrhosis is in the hepatitis wilson's disease alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency primary biliary cirrhosis and autoimmune hepatitis now coming to the microscopy there will be the loss of the normal architecture. If you remember the normal architecture, we have the hepatic lobules. So these hepatic lobules will have a central wing at the center. And then you have at the periphery, we have a portal triad. Triad means three. So at the portal triad, we have 
hepatic artery, portal vein and the bile duct. So this is present at the periphery and uh, the hepatocytes will be arranged radially from the central vein. This is the normal architecture. Now when the cirrhosis occurs because of the extensive fibrosis and the loss of the hepatocytes, this pattern of the arrangement is lost. So we have a loss of the normal architecture. Then we have uh, the necrosis and the hepatocytes which are remaining, they start proliferating. So we have a regenerating nodules and these regenerating nodules, they will be separated by bands, thickened bands of the fibrous tissue because the, if you remember etiopathogenesis, because the stellate cells, they will be deposition, they will be depositing lots of collagen that causes the fibrosis. So we have a thickened fibrous bands which will be dividing the hepatic parenchyma into the nodules. So we have regenerating nodules, extensive fibrosis and necrosis. Now what are the consequences of the cirrhosis? We have three important consequences. We have portal hypertension, then liver insufficiency and this also can lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. So we'll see what happens when the person has a portal insufficient, portal hypertension and liver insufficiency. So when uh, the person has a fibrotic liver, so because of the fibrosis, even there will be damage to the sinusoids. So there will be resistance to the uh, blood flow through this fibrotic liver. So obviously we have an increased back pressure in the portal vein. So this will cause increased pressure in the collateral venous system. So the organs wherever we have collateral venous system, there we have increased pressure and we have the bulging out of the vessels. So this collateral venous system we see in the esophagus and we see in the rectum and also the abdominal vessels. So what happens is uh, when there is an increased pressure, the veins will bulge out. So we have an esophageal varices more prone for the damage and the bleeding then we have in the rectum also we have the rectal varices and in the uh, abdominal vessels when there is a more pressure in the abdominal vessels fluid will leak out leading to the ascites similarly the back pressure in the portal uh, vein it will cause an increased pressure in the splenic vein so slowly we will have a splenomegaly congestive splenomegaly and this splenomegaly congestive splenomegaly it leads to the pancytopenia and uh, at the umbilicus we have engorgement of the veins which we call it as a caput medusae. Now because of the portal hypertension we have esophageal varices, splenomegaly leading to pancytopenia, then the rectal varices and there can be ascites also. Now another important thing in the uh, cirrhosis is we have seen that there will be increased pressure in the portal vein. But uh, another thing for this is there will be decreased output in the inferior venic vein. So we have a decreased flow to the heart. When there is a decreased flow to the heart, there is an increased adrenergic signaling. So this causes the contraction, more contraction of the heart and more pumping out of the blood. So when this occurs um, as a normal process, when, the, when there is an increased adrenergic signaling and cardiac output, most of the blood is shunted to the splenic, uh, splanchnic circulation. Splanchnic circulation means the circulation to the intestines. So you have the blood, most of the blood will be shunted to the uh, abdominal vessels. So obviously we have a decreased flow to other organs. And then we have a decreased flow to kidney also. When there is a decreased flow to the kidney as a uh, reflex mechanism, there will be activation of the renin angiotensin system and there will be more retention of the sodium and the water. Now this increases more the hydrostatic pressure. And again in the vessels, abdominal vessels, we have a more hydrostatic pressure so that fluid exudes out into the peritoneal cavity that causes the ascites. So cirrhosis as a whole, it causes increased uh, portal uh, hypertension, which causes all these varices. Along with that, again, there is an effect on the kidney which will cause more water in the sodium retention, which will further increase the pressure. So further increase in the pressure again leads to the ascites. So it is a vicious cycle going on. Now the another consequence is what I told you is the liver insufficiency. So the main function of the liver is it detoxifies the toxins, it metabolizes them. 
so the abdominal gut flora they will be producing ammonia glutamine methionine nitrogen serotonin and gamma amino butyric acids so all this substances they will be entering into the circulation but they will be detoxified in the liver but when we have a cirrhosis we have a loss of the parenchyma and the fibrosis because of which the liver will not be able to detoxify the ammonia so this uh, ammonia directly it enters into the into the brain by crossing the blood brain barrier not only that when you have a fibrotic liver and the blood is not able to flow through the portal vein into the liver then what happens slowly there will be a portosystemic shunt development so in the development of portosystemic shunt the blood flow will bypass the liver and uh, directly from the portal system they will enter into the systemic circulation so whatever toxins are present in the portal vein they will enter into the systemic circulation and they will directly go into the brain causing the blood brain barrier and that causes the encephalopathy so this is the cause of the encephalopathy in the cirrhotic liver now other effects of liver insufficiency is so in the cirrhosis we have seen there will be fibrosis so when there is a fibrosis there is a bile duct obstruction so this leads to a uh, decrease in the drainage of the conjugated bile and another thing is we have a damage to the hepatocytes so when the hepatocytes are damaged obviously conjugation of the bile is also reduced so both these conditions they lead to the jaundice and another uh, function of the liver is it produces the albumin so when the liver is not normal the synthesis of albumin is reduced when albumin decreases there is a decreased oncotic pressure in the systemic capillaries so this causes the exudation of the fluid into the interstitial tissue that causes the edema and another important thing is it there is also decrease in the synthesis of clotting factors and the anticoagulant proteins but as both are reduced there may not be uh, much of the coagulopathy because both anti and procoagulants are reduced so these are the effects of liver insufficiency we have encephalopathy jaundice and edema now how the hepatocellular carcinoma develops in the cirrhosis now we have I, we have already seen we have many causes which will be causing the damage to the hepatocytes and these hepatocytes they will undergo necrosis but the remaining hepatocytes they will be proliferating so these proliferating hepatocytes they form the regenerating liver nodules which are separated by the fibrous bands now these regenerating liver nodules will have the hepatocytes which are dividing very fastly now when the cells are proliferating fastly there can be uh, escape from the checkpoints which occurs in the mitosis and there can be some genomic instability so there will be some initially there will be some dysplastic change in the hepatocytes which are proliferating so this we call it as a dysplastic nodule later on if there is a marked genomic instability and loss of p53 also in this uh, dysplastic hepatocytes that leads to the development of the hepatocellular carcinoma so mainly when the cells are proliferating very fastly they can miss the checkpoints and that can develop the genomic instability so that is the cause for the development of the hepatocellular carcinoma so that is that finishes the consequences and in the summary if we see so grossly you have to remember the size is reduced and it has a nodular surface and depending upon the nodules we have classified them as micro and macro nodular and the size is cut off point is 3 mm then microscopy when you see we have a loss of the architecture we have necrosis regenerative nodules and the fibrosis and in the consequences of the cirrhosis three important consequences are portal hypertension hepatocellular carcinoma and liver insufficiency the consequences of portal hypertension are esophageal varices rectal varices splenomegaly leading to pancytopenia and ascites whereas consequences of liver insufficiency are edema jaundice and encephalopathy so that finishes uh, the consequences of the cirrhosis thank you friends thank you for listening patiently i want a feedback from uh, you uh, people so that i can improve my videos further thank you